CGTN, China Global Television Network. Grasa Michelle is a former Mozambican freedom fighter, international advocate for women's and children's rights, and the only woman in the world to be first lady for two separate countries. Following Mozambique's independence in 1975, she was appointed Minister for Education and led a movement to cut the illiteracy rate by 22% and to increase the school-going population from 400,000 to 1.6 million. Now her first marriage was to Mozambique's first democratically elected president, Samora Machel, until his death in 1986. And her second marriage was to Nelson Mandela in 1998. She has founded various organizations that work to ensure the rights of families and communities around Africa, including the Grasa Machel Trust, an organization which protects women and children's rights and promotes women's leadership across Africa. She is a founding member of the Elders, an independent group of global leaders who work together for peace and human rights. Her advocacy for education in Africa has also recently seen her appointed as Chancellor of the African Leadership University, a 21st century education institution that aims to create the next generation of African leaders. Well, I recently had the opportunity to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Grasa Michelle. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Mrs. Michelle, thank you very much for talking to us and thank you for your time. You're a very busy person, you know, with your contributions as an advocate or, or an international advocate for women and children's rights uh, at the African uh, Progress Panel, you know, with, with the MDGs. Tell me about the African Leadership University. Why did you get involved? The African Leadership University is a groundbreaking initiative. Uh, conceived by Africans for Africa, but also as a contribution for the global uh, tertiary education. And this was appealing to me. Let me explain. The concept, the methods, and the targets which are established for the African leadership university are new, absolutely challenging. One, it's an university which combines um, the formal education and the workplace, where students are some months at the campus, but they spend at least four months at the workplace. No one other university does this combination. The campus brings young people from all over the continent, bright minds, but who spend the time necessary to know each other. And for me, this is extremely important if you are to build the new concept of Pan-Africanism. It is different also because it focuses on leadership. It is not only to have the knowledge, the skills, but also to build the foundations of ethical leadership on top of young people who are from all over the continent, have the Pan-African identity and perspective. So it is a contribution which has not, has not been made before. That's why I was attracted to that. Let's look at the challenges. Uh, you talk about this uh, being an initiative that will look at the challenges uh, facing the continent and the solutions that uh, Africans can provide for that. What do you see as the challenges that we need to look at? Young people whose identity is Pan-African. It is not of a single country. It's one challenge. Second, the skills, knowledge and skills particularly, which are designed to meet specifically the needs of the continent. The African Leadership University is planning to have campus in different countries. So it is an institution which is multi-campus, 
located in different countries and this has not been done before that's the kind of challenge we are facing but at the same time you combine knowledge skills and leadership so it is a model which i believe it is going to produce the leaders not of tomorrow it's perhaps over five ten years already and in a basis of well-researched needs and trying to find this kind of uh, responses. So I believe we are moving in the right direction in terms of uh, who are we training for what. When we look at, um, uh, uh, apart from uh, the African Leadership University and what it is trying to do, when we look at the continent itself, let's look briefly at uh, the continent and education uh, in the continent. And I heard you earlier talking about when you uh, were made Minister of Education in Mozambique, where literacy levels were at 93%, and you brought that um, down. You are also massively credited with raising the literacy levels in, in Mozambique. Today we are talking about free uh, secondary education, free primary education. Is it achievable on the continent? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Some countries have done that already. It is a question of clarity on where do you invest. Our countries can provide primary and secondary education free if we realign where we invest. Let me give you an example. The budgets of education in many African countries do not compare with the, body, with the budgets of the military. Why do we need all this military? Who are we going to invade? Who is going to invite us, to invade us for us to invest so much? The sense of security which we need to develop. It has to be, yes, protecting the borders, etc. but it's more human security we need. And it's not necessarily to have heavy arms with heavy machinery, etc. Those funds channeled to education, and if you like, to health as well, they're going to boost the quality of our human capital. Why is it though that Africa still uh, lags behind though, still has the largest number, uh, or a very large number of out of school children? Again, it's a question of the investment we have been making. It is also true, and we have to acknowledge that, that in recent years, particularly in the era of MDGs, Africa is the continent which has expanded more in terms of bringing children into the system. The point is that we're starting from a very low level. And what is left now is precisely to bring in those children we call hard to reach. Who are they? Sometimes it's because in our countries we have not identified exactly who and ma how many are children with disability to bring them into the system. Some of the children are in a nomadic situations. You need to adjust your system to cover children even if they are moving with their communities. Other cases is communities which are extremely poor, in which because the government is not giving free education, families cannot afford to pay, or even if they, they say it's free, well, there are always issues with textbooks, and the issues with the uniform, etc., et which needs to be scrapped completely. But it, some governments have shown that this can be done and that there is a genuine effort to bring all those children into the system. Whose responsibility, though, should it be uh, to ensure that um, all um, children are catered for in terms of education? Government and parents. No one can replace a parent to take responsibility of sending his or her child to school, follow what happens at school, support the child not to drop out, and even when it's possible, to help with homework so that the child can be successful. So we tend to put a lot of responsibility only on the state, but in my view, it has to be a shared responsibility. Government, 
and families and communities actually, community leaders mobilizing and making clear to all families that this is an investment which is going to do good for the family, but for the nation as a well. whole. So we need to, 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 to develop that kind of uh, shared responsibility. How much gains though have been made in terms of education uh, across the globe because across the continent because sometimes we look at it from a not so holistic view and say well not much is happening now because there are students who are out of school there are others who are calling for free education. How much gains have actually been made uh, over the last 50 years? I can't talk over numbers because I was not prepared to, to, to talk about numbers. What I want to acknowledge is that really in terms of investment African countries have been doing. They need to do even more. And actually there's another element I'd like to raise is the quality of education. And that requires also a better investment. Teachers who are well trained, who are motivated because they have a dignified salary, they have support systems which keep teachers as really beacons in the communities because they are the one who build the bridge in between the family and the school and the state. So I think the investment which is required now is to bring the residual children who are out, but it's mainly also to improve the, the quality of education. We're going to take a short break now, but when we return, we'll continue our conversation with Mrs. Grassa Michelle. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. You talked earlier as well about uh, women and gains made in women's advancement and you talked about amplifying the voices so of Africa's women on the continent. Tell us about that initiative. I established uh, together with the some of my, my children, children of my heart, I established the Grass Michel Trust. Not as a, a, a name which is to be associated with me as such, but with my generation. We are women who have contributed very much, at least in the, er in the area of education. I don't know, you might know of the FAWE, the Forum of African Women Educationalists, who put exactly the girls' education on the map and the agenda of African countries. But now we need to create spaces where new generations of women take the center stage. And they are the ones who take from us and they can lead the transformation of women's status to the highest level. So for that, we say amplifying, multiplying faces is to have your face and the faces of these brilliant and talented and driven, passionate women who are making wonders in our countries to occupy the center stage in their countries, sub-regions, on the continent and globally. So that we say African women are not only those who are illiterate, those who are dying of malaria, those who are in poverty. There is actually a surge of African women who really define our identity. And so amplifying the voices of those is exactly to be them who tell their stories, who tell the challenges they face, but the triumph over challenges to inspire many other women, but more particularly to inspire the new generation so that the young girl has to be looking at you, Beatrice, and say, if she's there, it's because I can be there, I can even be better than herself, to inspire a surge and an increase of 
very proud, very self-confident women who know that there's no limits to what they can achieve. So we create this space through the networks of women which we are encouraging to strengthen themselves, to express themselves, to offer their stories and triumph, as I'm saying. It is my way, on behalf of my generation, of saying we retire, but we have left in a much broader space and platform hundreds, thousands of new generation of African women. When you look at, uh, before the new generation of African women, when you look at Africa's women today though, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges uh, that are still stumbling blocks for them before they achieve that dream? One of the things we do in the trust is, is exactly through the networks to identify what are the obstacles, the structural obstacles which we have to remove in a, in a certain period of time. Just to give you some examples, there are still lots of uh, countries where to have assets to land title deed, it's not allowed unless your husband authorized. We have to scrap that. What we do, engage governments to say, why? A woman, adult, citizen of a country, she knows what are the decisions about how to use the land which actually she is already telling the land. So why not to have a title? We have decided that in the next years to come, we really are going to work with all stakeholders to remove that. This is one. There are also obstacles, for instance, in assets to finance. There are women who are struggling. They do their best, but they don't have assets to capital. We have a network of financial inclusion, which is in 20 countries as we speak, and it's precisely to look country by country what has to be removed for us to open the avenues for women to have assets to capital. But more importantly now, we are working in establishing a women's investment fund because we believe women don't have only to be business, they also have to be investors, okay? and to give a space in which someone will understand much better what are the needs of a woman who is, you know, juggling between profession, family, etc. But it's to do business and get assets to capital. So we're creating this fund by women, for women, and it is going to be managed by women. It is our contribution, so removing the obstacles which are to be structurally opening space for now thousands and hopefully in future there will be millions of women then to do their things and their business easily without those kind of hurdles. So when you look at it though, th th this is a phase that is going to pass and the World uh, Economic Forum released a report that still shows that uh, the global gender gap is now widening this year for the first time since 2006 and Africa is still lagging behind particularly in terms of representation, uh, in terms of health, in terms of education. What can we do? Actually, I think there's one element in which Africans are ahead in certain countries. If you put it like that, it's like we are all lagging behind. But to give you an example, in political representation, oh no, there are many African countries which are ahead of the developed world. Rwanda is an example which is hailed everywhere. But even many other countries, like those who went through the liberation struggle, they are over. 40% of representation of women in parliament and some, in some cases even in government. So it's not all as negative as we are presented. We also looked, for instance, in terms of women who are in position of leadership, at least at the medium level in business. No, African women are faring very well, actually. We are the, the continent which is growing faster. And this is due, you know, to what? It's your generation. 
these young women who are bubbling with ideas, with uh, inventors, the, the openings, the new spaces. These are the ones who are changing the landscape. But this has not been seen yet. It's precisely because of that we establish the multiplying faces, amplifying voices. <coughs> because it's here. It's not yet very visible. And we need to create platforms for visibility. And if you want to know, the Grace Michelle Trust did have this year, for the first time, a Pan-African Forum in which we brought women from different sectors, from all over the, co the continent, exactly to, one, to celebrate success. Celebrate success. Second, to say, where do we want to be in the next five, 10 years? But in the collective agenda designed by us, driven by us. And you know what the women said? It took me even much higher than I could have expected. They said, you know, in the first liberation for independence, we were not so much at the driving seat. In this second liberation, that's how they call it, the second liberation, which is for transforming the economy and society, we are going to be at a driving seat, and we are going even to redesign the table of the decision making. So it's not just to join the decision making, it's to redesign the rules of the decision making. I was taken, really, and I'm thrilled because it's young women who have taken that responsibility of transforming economically and socially our societies. So I'm planning to retire while I'm more comfortable that, no, 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 no. These children of mine are really self-confident. They know where they want to go and how they want to get there. So when we look at uh, the, the women uh, empowerment uh, proposals and the projects, when we look at the children's proposals and the projects, all these ties, ties down to good leadership on the continent. If our forefathers were to look at us today, having uh, gone through the 50 years, if they were to look back at what we have done today, what do you think they would be saying? You know, the continent has transformed itself. And even our society, uh, at, a, at a situation where you have still, I mean, huge challenges, but I think it's important for us to celebrate success. Even if your challenges are at, in, in terms of you have 60% of challenges, but you have 40% of success, please do celebrate the 40% because it's going to give you the energy to leap to the next stage. Just the fact that you, Beatrice, you are sitting here and you are interviewing me, it shows change. 50 years back, you wouldn't be where you are. Go to our universities, for instance. There are countries where in universities we have more girls than boys. This is progress. We should celebrate that. What does it mean? It's not because we don't want boys to be equally successful. What we are saying is that there is a surge which is saying young women do value, I mean, science, do value, I mean, the ability to have the knowledge and skills to take control of their lives and to make a better contribution to society. This is change. So sometimes we are too obsessed with the, what still has to be done, and we miss the point of looking back, take stock, value, what we have achieved so that we'll have better ability to face the, the, the future. So I think you as media, now if I can come, come to you, you need to help us this. Celebrate success. Celebrate the, the, the kind of a transformation which has happened and then you say, but what are we going to achieve next so that we'll continue to, 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 to work to that. By the way, we established also a network of women in media. I'm I don't a member. Think, yes, you are a member of women in media. Why? Because you want you, we want you to intentionally look for these inspiring stories of women like you and bring them to the fore. So that really our children will have this balanced perspective and view of 
who we are as society, men and women, and not only be overwhelmed by the negative. So take stock for us, because you said we need to take stock of where we've been, because you were with the liberation struggle. You watched uh, the post-colonial Africa. You've seen the modernizing Africa. Take stock for us. What are we doing right? What are we getting wrong? Where are we exactly? I think we, as a society, we are doing relatively well when it comes to counting successes as education, even in health, although we still have some challenges. You know, where we, I believe it's the worst of our failure. It's in human relations. The levels of uh, gender violence which exist on the continent are telling us that we haven't found the right way of men and women talking to each other in understanding, not only understanding, but also prepared to give and take. Many of the men believe that they have the right, the right of the body of a woman. They have the right to make decisions whether she can work or not work, to make the right to treat a woman as if it's even worse than a child, because you, you respect your child, but they, they treat women as if they were things, they were commodities. They're not, they don't have the dignity, the human dignity as any other human being. And that is our biggest challenge. And I don't think that we have made a lot of progress. So we need to be focusing on how do we, we as parents, particularly we as mothers, how do we raise our girls and boys? So that the generations which are growing up now will be able to respect each other and accept each other, not only to respect, but to accept each other, to recognize and value the dignity, the human dignity of each one of us. So that is one of the challenges, which it's not only African, by the way, it's global. But we as Africans, we have to face our own realities and to say, ah, 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 this cannot continue like this. This cannot continue like this. So while we can register these successes in education, in workforce, for instance, and in certain sectors, you have really a significant presence of women in entrepreneurship, women who are coming, etc., etc. Human relations have to change, respecting and accepting the dignity of each other. A final comment for me, Mrs. Michelle. When you look at Africa today, are you optimistic? And if you are, why? Definitely. I am an optimistic person. Otherwise, I wouldn't be continuing, I mean, the struggles which I'm involved in. If I did not believe that the transformation can be driven by all of us, children, adolescents, young people, mature people, and old people like me, I wouldn't wake up in the morning and worry about the causes I'm embracing. But I'm more domestic. I know also that this transformation make, mark my, my words, I'm not talking about change. When it comes to society, you don't change, you transform. It's not like moving from one place to the other, no. You'll have a process in the, where the positive and the negative will be playing together. But you make sure that the positive is the one which is raising, uh, raising and the negative is coming down. So in that process, Yes, I'm very optimistic, and I have to tell you that preparing for my retirement, I'm very confident that you and your sisters and your brothers, by the way, you will take this continent of ours to highest levels. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.